Yeah, okay. Okay, so we finished off last time talking about how bone comes together. Um, and we see that certain areas of the, uh, the bone will be formed during, um, you know, from second and third month of embryological development on on, you know, all the way through birth. That's going to be what's happening, which some of this primary ossification happening at the diapsis. Everyone know where the diapsis is by now? The main center part of the bone of a typical long bone here. Then after birth, we're going to finish off those epiphyses. Um, that's when we have the effect of gravity and all the mechanical forces, uh, you know, the blessings of living in a gravitational world to put physical stress on the bone to enable the joints to be built and developed properly with the cartilage and everything and the muscles attaching. All that stuff is going to happen after birth uh, to finish it off, I should say, for the strength of it all. So if we're looking at long bone here, um, we see a cartilage model that's formed. What type of bone formation is this? Is this endochondral or intramembranous? Which one? We're looking at a long bone. Endochondral, right. And how do we know that? Because we're looking at cartilage. So I want you guys to start noticing these roots and these words. It's going to help a lot in the Anytime you see C-H-O-N-D, that's going to be cartilage. All right, anytime you see osteo, that's going to be bone. So just watch out for those. So if we're looking at cartilage, what type of cells will, will be responsible for building cartilage? Would it be a chondroblast or an osteoblast? Chondroblast. So we would expect chondroblasts to have built this cartilage model, right? Osteoblasts will then come in and basically kill <laughs> the cartilage cells. It's like a little war, a territory war. Here in this primary ossification center, right there in the diapsis, the center shaft, this is the primary ossification center, happening when, before or after birth? Before birth, right? Osteoblasts will invade the chondrocytes, which are the mature cells of the cartilage, and take over and then ossify, which means to mineralize the bone. So if you're, I'm just trying to get your terminology lined up. If you've got general connective tissue that we start off with, you know, last, last week, that's that embryonic mesenchyme, right? That's going to change to cartilage. Which cell builds the cartilage? The chondroblasts, right? Now we get primary ossification happening at the diaphysis using what type of cell? Osteoblasts. That's what's going to put down the calcium salts, which is going to, quote unquote, mineralize the bone. So this is the story. If you want to call it a story, this is what's happening when you say ossification, which is an organized bone development, rather than calcification, which is just calcium just being thrown around, you know? So these osteoblasts are making the matrix, which is a mixture of thickened collagen and then hardened calcium. Right? So the thickened collagen gives you the density of the bone. The hardened calcium mineral, which is the inorganic, right, part of the matrix, gives you the hardness of the bone. So if you don't know those two properties of that matrix, it's going to, it's not going to, uh, you know, help you on the test <laughs> to understand the full story, because that's the way it's explained. That's how ossification is explained. You have to know what that matrix is made of. Collagen, which gives you the density and the thickness, and then the inorganic portion would be that calcium, the salts, right, giving you the hardness of them. So happening here, finishing off the diapsis, we're going to get some blood vessels coming in to bring more nutrients, more calcium, more salts to harden that bone, right? Through diffusion, of course. These, the calcium is a mineral, no doubt, right? It's an ion. It's going to come right through the cell membrane of that blood vessel, right? Right into the bone marrow. From an area of high concentration in the blood, 
to an area of lower concentration of the bone as it's being built. Right? Diffusion. Right in there. So then we get our diopsis built. Now what happens? Reform. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Happy birthday. Then we're going to finish off the epiphyses here in what's called secondary ossification. And now we get to see, we realize that the cartilage that was once there before from our cartilage model is still the same cartilage that persists right here in the growth plate and at the edge where we have the articulate cartilage. So what kind of cartilage is this? Both, both the growth plate, growth plate and the epiphyseal cartilage, what kind is that? Is it hyaline, fibro, or elastic cartilage? Hyaline cartilage, right. Test question. Please know that growth plate cartilage and articular cartilage at the epiphyses this is all going to be hyaline cartilage, which is the most abundant cartilage around the body. Elastic cartilage is going to be that which we see in the ear, right? We'll, we'll learn that later on. Fibro cartilage is going to be those thick chunks of cartilage we see in the discs of the spine. So don't let that trip up your, your answer choice. This is always going to be highland cartilage right here. All right, so that's our ossification, guys. We depend on the gravitational pull and the use of our muscles pulling on the bone. That, that's what you call mechanical forces. And actually, the gravitational push is what they really refer to it as. Your typical baby crawling around, you know, moving around the earth, uh, finishing off the joints with the stress on the bone like that. That's what's needed is physical stress on the bone. Okay, so going back to about a 12 week period, third month of development here, this is what mostly your skeleton is gonna look like. It's part cartilage, part bone. You can see that we've not finished off the epiphyses yet. So any of these blank areas you see at the wrists and ankles, elbows and such at the hip, it's still bone there, but it's still cartilaginous type bone. It's not fully ossified bone. So that's why you see the gaps. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> so here we go, talking about those growth plates again. There's our hyaline cartilage, which we'll now call residual hyaline cartilage. Why do we say residual? It was there to begin with, right? It was the model of cartilage before, and it just stuck around to maintain that cartilage at the growth plate. So that's why it's called residual. So don't let that throw you if you see that pop up. So key terms that we talked about last time, if it's an open growth plate, it's called epiphyseal plate. If it's a closed growth plate, we call it the epiphyseal line. So make sure you got that all straight to the tests. This will be on the test. Yes. And then we come to the board and I'm gonna throw in some chapter nine terms at you right now just to get you ready for chapter nine. Uh, Y'all may not be ready for chapter nine, <laughs> but we're gonna pretend, how about that? Chapter nine, oh my goodness. It's a very like concise chapter. It doesn't really go, there's not many tangents to it. It's all about classifying the joints. So every joint we have, right, all around the body, we're just gonna say it belongs to this class or that class. And we're gonna give certain names of those joints. So to give you a preview, some joints don't move, like these. The two bones in the skull, they, they're a joint, but they don't move. Some joints move a little bit. Some joints move a lot. Some joints will have cartilage. Some joints won't have cartilage. So each of these descriptions is going to mean a certain class of joint. Well, the class of joint that makes this a fifth seal line since it does not move, it's closed, it's fused, we're gonna call that the term on the right on the board, synostosis. And if you look at the play on the anatomy of that word, uh, syn, S-Y-N, <clears throat> means to come together. Os, at the root of that word there in the middle, means bone, and then osis means condition of. So if we read that word backwards, starting with osis, it's a condition of bone coming together, right? So that's what a synostosis is. It's anything that's fused, right? Any bones that have fused 
A is going to be called a synostosis, which then we'll call it in a class of a bony joint. <laughs> What's the, what do you think the difference is between a cartilaginous joint and a bony joint is? The presence of cartilage, yes. So a bony joint, does it have any cartilage? No, no longer. The cartilage has been killed off. Right the osteoblast have invaded it, closed it off. It's a done deal. It's now called a bony joint. So, uh, oh my God, you can smell the multiple choice coming, can't you? That in a hip seal line is known as a closed growth plate, a bony joint, and a synostosis, and an epiphyseal line, right? All four times the same thing. Doesn't that sound like a test question? Like an A and C type test question? Or A, B, C, D? Color in all those bubbles, baby. There you go. Whereas an open growth plate, since it has cartilage, we're going to call that a synchondrosis. Why do we call it synchondrosis? Because C-H-O-N-D means cartilage. Right. It's technically a joint, weirdly enough. We don't want to think of it as a joint because it doesn't move, right? But it is a joint because it's pieces of bone that are coming together with a little bit of cartilage in between, right? So technically it is a joint. So that's the nice little preview I've got for you for chapter nine. And we're gonna call that a primary cartilaginous joint. Because guess what? If there's a primary, there's gonna be a secondary, which will be something we'll cover in chapter nine. So I'm just, maybe you don't wanna know that for now, but you want to at least reference it, link it up when we do get to chapter nine, maybe you'll be more ready for it then. But I'll mention it at that point. So I like, for you to have seen and heard things twice because it's easier for it to stick to your brain. Okay, any questions on this terminology? You can bet that's going to be there. All right. Great. So this is a cute little video on how we can make an osteon. Let me show you that real fast. Bones grow through the process of appositional growth the formation of new bone on the surface of older bone or cartilage. Osteoblasts beneath the periosteum lay down bone to form ridges around a blood vessel. The blood vessel lies in a groove between the ridges. The groove is transformed into a tunnel when the bone built on the adjacent ridges meets. The periosteum of the groove becomes the endosteum of the tunnel. Osteoblasts from the endosteum lay down bone to form a new concentric lamella. The production of additional concentric lamellae fills in the tunnel and completes the formation of a new osteon. All right, this video should have been something we watched Thursday. My bad, we just kind of out of place like that. All right, so getting into our third um, big objective here from this chapter, we'll start talking about how bones can be shaped differently and a little bit of Lastly, the last object would be getting into pathology. So for the hormonal mechanisms, the hormonal metabolism of bone, it all starts with uh, growth hormone. It's written here as human growth hormone. It's the same as growth hormone. So just think of it as GH, growth hormone. This is what drives, this is the main driver for bone and muscle growth. Bone and skeletal muscle growth, I should say. And when you get to AMP2, you'll learn that the thyroid hormone, which is uh, both T3 and T4, two different hormones that have either three iodines or four iodines in their makeup. T3 and T4, your thyroid hormones. Thyroid hormone will be uh, what we call synergistic to growth hormone, which means they play off each other. Does anyone know what thyroid hormone is responsible for? If you've ever known about thyroid diseases, it kind of tells the, the answer. It uh, has to do with metabolism. So thyroid hormone is what keeps the metabolism up. So generally, taller, bigger people have a higher metabolism, right? typically speaking, which means they'll have a bigger skeleton. So growth hormone goes up, thyroid hormone goes up. Thyroid hormone goes up, <laughs> growth hormone goes up. They play off each other like a little contest. That's the synergism between those two hormones. For the shape of our skeleton, or the, you know, the, the, I don't know what you can say about the quality of it, maybe. That's gonna be dependent on some of the testosterone and estrogens um, 
they give a more male or female type of skeleton. So there's some classic differences, especially at the pelvis and the size of the bones, of course, like the scapula but, and the pelvis that would indicate a more male or female skeleton. And of course, there's always the case of a female, you know, having a more male type skeleton or a male having a more female type skeleton. That's just all having to do with the, you know, the hormones that are coming out. So both male and female will produce these hormones, but just in lesser, you know, a male will produce estrogens, but in a, in a very much a lesser extent. Because obviously there's no ovaries there, so they produce on a different pathway. Females do produce small amounts of testosterone, right? Uh, but not from the testicles, right? So there's different versions of these hormones that come out in the opposite sex, um, but they're just in less, less of a uh, population of it in the bloodstream. These two types of dwarfism, um, well, this person is not a dwarf, of course. <laughs> what a silly picture, I don't know where this picture came from. <laughs> anyway. Pituitary dwarfism is when the whole skeleton is smaller, whereas achondroplastic dwarfism is more so when the trunk is normal, the torso is normal, but just the limbs are shortened. So that's just a, a simple definition there. Not, not a big reason for discussion there. Keep in mind your two, your two main cells we're gonna get into, osteoblasts, osteoclasts. We'll talk about those again today. It's the osteoclast that's going to shape the bone. Osteoblast is going to make the bone, right? And you could say osteoclast can also mold, you know, or resorb the bone. But these statistics that you see here, you know, I'm not going to test you on that. That's, that's to me, I don't like that trivial stuff. I'm more so talking about the bone cells. That's what I want you to know. So any slides that I skip, it just means we're not doing them. We got to keep our focus, right? We can't, can't be responsible for every single thing. Um, calcium homeostasis is at the heart of all bone remodeling. That and the mechanical gravitational forces. So the fact that you're born into a gravitational world means you will have a physical stress against your bones and muscles just being on Earth, right? If you're floating in space on a space station, then you're going to lose your bone mass. So whenever we do have, you know, the opportunity to live up in space one day, we'll have to have either some kind of suit on us that puts stress on our skeleton or ankle weights or some kind of pressure on the skeleton to, to uh, constantly influence the bone to maintain itself. So you could almost say it's the same in... In, uh, in the way we're reared as children, if we're not you know, challenged and taught to overcome our fears and difficulties, we don't build up to be a strong person. You know, Same thing with bone. If bone is never stressed or put into, um, into a situation where there happen, some movement happen, it's gonna, it's gonna weaken. So when the bone weakens, the muscle weakens. When the muscle weakens, all the connective tissue that connects the muscles is going to carry toxins. And that's what ages you, that's what makes you feel stiff and gross and just, then you don't want to move. Then if you don't move, what happens? Your posture goes, right? You start slumping. And when you slump, what happens to your lung capacity, your respiratory capacity? You can't really breathe so well. So I am a huge, or I should say it backwards, I am not, a huge fan at all of lazy boy recliners because any recliner that kind of you ever sit in a recliner that kind of cups the back and you like to sink into it that's terrible for your respiratory capacity and your lungs your, your ribs are being like shrunken in and you can't breathe and man without oxygen what do you think happens to your cellular metabolism <laughs> it takes a dive so You'll learn if you ever go down this uh, pathway in your education, there are certain doctors, right? There's MDs, which are your standard you know, medical science doctors, and those osteopathic doctors that have very big training in uh, the musculoskeletal system, right? Then there's chiropractors, right? So the DO is like a mixture, you could say kind of like a mixture of a chiropractor and an MD, 
They have all the licensure to prescribe medication like an MD, but they also respect and love the musculoskeletal frame as a means of a, a basis of overall health. Whereas chiropractors take the more, you know, strict approach to homeopathy and strictly work on the frame. We don't prescribe drugs. We just do other things to help the body. But DOs, if you've ever heard of it, are now integrated in most hospitals and they have this training as well to understand the relevance of the musculoskeletal frame to overall health is what I'm trying to say, not just for the fact of moving or not. So all this, what I'm trying to say is bone remodeling is not just about keeping bone strong. It connects to the muscles, the tissues, which then connects to the organs. It becomes a whole body thing. When people lose their framework of their body, they get weak, they get sick easy, all kinds of things happen. And it's terrible. I've seen it so much. It really is. And it's so fixable. And yes, I'm going to put it on recording. It pisses me off that it's so fixable. And yet people just don't do it. They just say, ah, I'll just take a pill. Maybe the pill will do it for me. Well, we all know how that goes. This pill leads to that pill. That pill leads to this pill. Before you know it, you're 50 years old, 60, 70, taking 12 pills. By the time you retire, half your money goes to copays. You know, that's not a way to retire. I see it with my mom and dad, unfortunately. It's very fixable, though. That's why I have to limit my exposure going to Walmart. I have to walk like this with blinders on. I can't. It's too painful for me to see people barely walking <laughs> or slumped over when I know it affects their whole life. I just want to go up there and, you know, <laughs> fix them. So if I'm ever behind you in line and you feel some random dude like coming straight in your back, there you go, it's me. I once met my girlfriend, my daughter's boyfriend rather, at Walmart. And I didn't know he was my daughter's boyfriend. So I get home and I tell her, there was this dude in front of me, his pants were like down at his knees, right? And he was flipping his hair like the whole time. And she goes, you know, was that so-and-so? I think his name was William. I'm like, I don't know what his name was, you know, but, you know, I described him. And sure enough, when you find out, it actually was him because he told her he was at Walmart and that he thinks he saw your dad. So isn't that funny? Look at here, dude. Turn up your drug addict. So glad that didn't work out. But because I didn't like him, she loved him, right? That's how it goes. Yep. Anyway, he had bad pocket. That's why I was... That's why I noticed it. <laughs> anyway, so you get, you get the drift. Lack of exercise, yes, it will atrophy bone, atrophy muscle. This is not being used. That word atrophy means it just, just wastes away. You know, you lose it. So we need exercise. We need stress in the bone. So skip over all this. We don't need all that. Okay, getting into our three big uh, hormonal mechanisms. Here we go. This is our first one. If we pay attention to this fancy word here, but dad, you're such a nice guy, she tells me of this William guy. Got kicked out of high school for fighting like five times and drugs. It's like, what's so nice about him? But dad, you just don't know his heart. Oh my Lord. Like, listen. Like I care about this guy's heart. Come on now. <laughs> but dad, I hear that a lot. <laughs> His heart. Oh my goodness. This tough being a dad, I'll tell you that. <laughs> All right, this is vitamin D. Look at that calcitriol on the far right again. This is our activated vitamin D. So we take the pathway. You don't have to know this pathway, guys. But check it out from <laughs> Julius Caesar here. Um, UV light makes a reaction in our skin that causes the liver and the kidney through several processes to come up with activated vitamin D. So yes, sunlight helps us make vitamin D in our body, which we're going to call the activated form of it is calcitriol. 
So long story short, not to make this too terribly difficult, because already you're wanting to run, looking at all that. I can feel it. Vitamin D is necessary for your body to absorb calcium. That's why this is so important as, a, as one of the three main players in our hormonal mechanisms for bone remodeling and maintenance. So yeah, you need vitamin D. Check it out. Even, you know, we get it. Oops, where'd it go? We can get it from the diet, yes, right? Dairy, certain fish and stuff like that. But we also need it from sunlight because the dietary is not enough. So if you're taking calcium or eating calcium, that's cool. But if you don't have vitamin D in your body, guess what? You're not going to absorb it. So the main thing that vitamin D is going to offer us, the main thing you got to know for the test, well, first of all, that it comes from sunlight and the diet, yes. But second of all, it helps us to absorb that calcium in the small intestine. If you can eat the calcium, and if you don't absorb it, guess what? The calcium is no good. You need to absorb it in the bloodstream properly. And that's that's what this calcium gel does. It helps to absorb calcium. So here we go. Here's our three main players, guys. So now that we've done the first, we know what calcium gel does. Make yourself a list. You just have to know what each of these does and with each of these, where they come from. So maybe make yourself a list. Do, you know, calcitriol, calcitonin, parathyroid, a vertical list like this. And then on the top part of this list, you want the function, where it comes from, right? And you could say, um, you could also put trigger up there. Stimulus. The function, the stimulus, and where it comes from at the top. And we'll fill this all in. Because this is what, you know, we're going to go through about, I don't know, maybe eight slides here. And they're going to get pretty confusing. So I'm just trying to warn you. Before things get all kinds of ugly looking, this is what they have to know. The function the stimulus, and then where they come from. Function, stimulus, and you can say origin, or where it comes from at the top, and we'll fill it all in. So let's work on the first one again, calcitriol. What's the function? It absorbs calcium in the small intestine into the bloodstream, you know? Absorption of calcium, basically you just put that. Absorption of calcium in the small intestine. So since we're absorbing calcium, the stimulus would be low blood calcium bubbles, wouldn't it? If we need calcium, then we need to absorb it, don't we? So the stimulus would be low blood calcium. That's why we would absorb it, does that make sense? Guess what? If you don't need to absorb it, you're not going to. The body can regulate that. If you don't need to absorb it, calcitriol will be low level. Take a break. Take a back seat, right? <clears throat> so again, the function is to uh, absorb calcium. The stimulus would be low blood calcium levels. And where does it come from? Diet and sunlight. Test question, test question, test question. This will be how to tackle the third objective of hormonal metabolism. These three things right here. Calcitonin, its function will be to lower blood calcium levels. I think of it as toning down calcium. That's how I've always remembered it. It lowers blood calcium. Levels. You got it. If, if the job is to lower blood calcium, the stimulus would be if you have a higher calcium level, this is when calcium is kick in. So the stimulus is high levels of calcium. The function is low, low to lower blood calcium. 
and it comes from the thyroid gland. And then parathyroid hormone, its job, its function is going to be to also raise or increase blood calcium levels along with calcitriol, if you notice them. They help to increase blood calcium levels. So therefore, its trigger would be what? If you have low blood calcium levels, right, that would be the trigger. Or the stimulants. Welcome to the world of endocrinology, by the way. This is a headache. It's waiting to happen. The, uh, the trigger, the stimulus would be low, low levels of calcium to raise, to increase it. So you check your functions and your stimuli. They should be opposite of each other, right? That's how you know you got it right. So you should end up with both calcitriol and parathyroid hormone increasing blood calcium, right? Therefore, they're triggered to be both what? Low levels, right? But with that, here comes the, the next little, you know, layer. If calcitriol has already absorbed enough calcium for the blood to be happy, then it's going to tell PTH, parathyroid, to back off. So if calcitriol is high enough, it could inhibit PTH. We put like a little arrow from calcitriol to PTH that it could inhibit, right? Vice versa, actually, PTH could inhibit calcitriol too. <laughs> so that's what I'm telling you. It's about to get all kinds of crazy, but we're going to stop right there. We're not going to go any more crazy than that. But when you get to A and P2, that's when you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, if you if calcitriol is responsible for absorbing calcium, if we've already absorbed enough calcium from the diet, that kind of thing, then maybe PTH needs to take a break. It doesn't need to increase anymore. So it's going to inhibit PTH, or it could. Inhibit PTH. That's what I was saying. PTH is parathyroid hormone. Right. The stimulus, not, not that it will increase, but the stimulus would be if it is increased. Yeah. What, which one? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, did, I didn't say that one yet. From the parathyroid gland. Yeah. Parathyroid hormone comes from parathyroid gland. So that's one quick, well, maybe it took us five minutes. That's one five minute way of rounding up the hormonal mechanisms, right? That mainly are responsible for regulating or remodeling the bones. Of course, growth hormone and thyroid hormone are still going to have a, a play on this, uh, you know, in the background. But this is the mineralization, how we play with that right here. Okay, so let's let's see what we got here. Calcitriol, what does it do? It raises blood calcium, right? Meaning that it can increase calcium absorption, therefore raising it. And if you want to, if you want to test your brain, you can figure out what's going on in each of these pictures. But I don't want to spend time with all that because it, honestly, it's just going to confuse some people. It's going to confuse everyone at some point, you know. So it's, I think it'd be worth you playing for this uh, on your own time, figuring it out. It's all there, but from what we stated just now, that's what you need to open test. That's why I don't want to confuse anyone going this route. So if we don't have calcium absorption, right? And remember the nickname for calcitriol is vitamin D. Don't get confused with that. We're talking about vitamin D. That's what it is. If we don't have vitamin D, therefore we're not absorbing calcium. What does calcium do to the bone? Hardens it. So without calcium being available, 
you get this bowing of the bone, which is known as softening of the bone. It's the densities there, it's still thick, but it's not as hard as what it needs to be. So over time, you know, months and months and months, it causes the bone to, to bend like this under gravity. The person just doesn't wake up and step out of bed and have you know, loose legs or something. This is over time. Does it hurt? No. Uh, it can hurt the ankles and the low back, yes. These people that have low back pain, yes. But the, it doesn't hurt the legs. It could stress out the knees on the outside. Later on, arthritis would be uh, coming in on the outside of the knees from that angle. But there you go. This is called rickets in children and osteomalacia in adults. Same disease process, which is softening of the bone, otherwise known as demineralization. You lost the minerals or you just never had them in the bone in enough of a uh, concentration. So there's got to be an answer. If somebody knows, they can please let me know, educate me. But I don't know why it's called two different things for the same disease. I was joking about the class. If the doctor gave me a choice, I would tell him I would want the osteomalacia. I wouldn't want anything called rickets. If I was a kid, it sounds like a bunch of bugs crawling around your bones. <laughs> but yeah, with bracing and, and proper nutrition, you could, you know, there is some uh, therapy with this. But yeah, this is what we're looking at with osteomalacia and rickets. It's a softening of the bone also called demineralization of the bone. Okay. So next up, calcitonin. This is going to be from the thyroid gland. It's gonna lower blood calcium, which means it's triggered by a high level of calcium in the blood. Okay, so all these other things, uh, all this stuff, I'm not really worried about that. You know, just know the, the bolded thyroid, high blood calcium is the trigger. Its job is to lower blood calcium. Now, one thing I do want to uh, point out, calcitonin, since high blood calcium is not really a thing in adults because we use calcium so much in our muscles, this will really only be so much in children and possibly in a pregnant woman where it's used. So we don't see calcitonin in large levels in adults. We will not see large levels of calcitonin in adults. Because you, re you rarely would have high blood calcium as an adult. Because it's used so quickly. Okay, and our last one, the big one, parathyroid, comes from the parathyroid gland. It's triggered by low blood calcium because its job is to increase blood calcium. So you know, you know how it goes, guys. You're gonna probably need to expose yourself to this a few times to not get it mixed up. It, it is gonna get mixed up. But you need to practice to where you're not mixed up. Okay, so this is the feedback loop that was mentioned on your first exam. This is responsible for increasing blood calcium. So how do we do it? Let's forward to the feedback loop here. I'm gonna come back. This is it right here. So in a level situation, this is nice homeostasis, right? But when calcium levels are lower than needed, it's going to trigger the parathyroid hormone to re, or parathyroid gland to release parathyroid hormone, which is PTH. Once PTH is released in the bloodstream, it eventually gets in the bloodstream, I should say, it's going to call upon osteoclasts. It's going to increase osteoclastic activity, which what happens with the osteoclast? It's going to attach the bone. 
So liquefy the bone and take the calcium, right? And we'll put it in the bloodstream. So what happens when the osteoclasts have taken the calcium and put it in the bloodstream? We now have a higher blood calcium level, so it's going to turn off that stimulus. This is a negative feedback loop. We started off with low blood calcium levels. We ended up with higher blood calcium levels. That's a classic negative feedback. So just get the order in which it happens. You know that could be worded in some type of a test question. What causes parathyroid gland to release PTH? You tell me. Low blood calcium levels. What causes increased osteoclastic activity? Increase in PTH levels, right? <clears throat> what causes the negative feedback uh, loop to occur? High levels of calcium at the very end would cause negative feedback loop to turn off, right? Okay, so just as long as you get those in order, you should be good. And here's a little review of both of those together. Maybe another way to study it was looking at it like this. Same information, but just pick your pick your favorite layout, you know? Okay, there was one other thing I wanted to go back to, and then we'll move on. Oh, my bad. Go ahead. Okay. So let me go back to this slide here. So this one is also a scary slide. <laughs> Who wants to remember all those words? Probably no one. So I'm going to tell it to you in a different way, and then which will make this make a lot more sense. It's kind of like magic. So let's start with hypercalcemia. Everyone should at least know this is a higher level of calcium than needed. This will cause muscles to become, let's put it in an easy format, non-responsive. Muscle becomes non-responsive with too much calcium. With high, th you think of it as, if anyone has ever heard of uh, flooding out an engine, you know, where the engine won't start anymore, too much fuel being pushed down or something. This is too much calcium. The muscle says, hey, I can't take it, it's too much. You know? Too much, can't handle it. Muscle is non-responsive. So in case of cardiac arrest, is the heart non-responsive? Yes, it is. <laughs> so if you can remember non-responsive, each one of these will make sense. Is muscle less excitable when it's non-responsive? Responsive, yes, it is. All right, so remember that key term, non-responsive. For hypo, when calcium is too low, Muscles are going to be irritated and twitchy. So would muscle spasms fall under this? Yes, muscle spasms are irritated and twitchy. Think of these as non-reliable muscle contractions. So one more time, hyper is non-responsive muscle. Hypo, which is the lower level of calcium, is non-reliable not reliable muscle contraction. It can still contract, but it's not reliable. So spasms, tetany. Tetany is a sustained contraction. That doesn't help either. Okay, so that was that. Um, the only other thing here is what we already stated. Uh, these are like duplicate slides, Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law just tells us that we have to use the bone or else we'll lose it. If no stress is being put on the bone, we're going to lose the, the bones. So we need physical stress. That's what Wolf was trying to tell us. It, uh, it grows and remodels based on the stress or demands placed on it. See, just like us, we grow and model ourselves <laughs> based on the goals we put for ourselves and the demands we put on ourselves. If we keep telling each other that we're losers, well, guess what? <laughs> you're not going to become much else 
except the loser. So we can't do that. <laughs> Okay, we can skip this also. This is going to bring us into our, our pathology, our fractures. So we'll talk a little bit about fractures and we'll look at some x-rays. And then we'll um, we'll do about 10 or 12 minutes on an intro to chapter eight, which is what you already had in lab last week. So that should be easy to run, to run through. Okay, here we go, guys. Looking at fractures, these are the descriptions of the words here that you see that we're going to use to describe this picture. I'm going to come back to it and just talk to you about what's going on in each of these. Look at the placement of this fracture. It's across the bone, so that's transverse. This one's up and down, so it's linear on the left side. If it's diagonal, we call that oblique or spiral. Same thing, basically. A spiral is more of a twisting fracture, but there's still diagonal in the presentation on the bone. So those should be easy to call out, right? Whether it's a cross for transverse, up and down for linear, diagonal for spiral or, or um, oblique. A green stick fracture is gonna be one that breaks. It's a, it's a break in the bone, but it's not all the way through the bone. Therefore, the bone is still together. So a green stick fracture is when it's broken, but it's still together. If you look at this marker here, if I take the marker and like, cut the, the cap away from it, you know, into two pieces. That will be a complete fracture because it broke into complete two new pieces. It's incomplete if it's broken and still attached, which is what a green stick would be. A green stick fracture is broken, but still intact, still put together. A comminuted fracture, I'm not gonna have this one on the test actually, mm -hmm. But that's just a, um, a fragmented fracture. It's many fragments of bone in a common So let's go back to this here. Displaced versus non-displaced, that has to do with whether the bone is in its normal placement. So look at this one here. Is this bone in its normal placement? Yes, it's non-displaced. Okay. This one is not in its normal presentation. So it is displaced. So when a bone goes out of its normal, you know, shape, I guess, or where it should be, it's displaced. If it happens to break the skin, comes through the skin, I should say, then we call that open. So displaced fractures, if they're inside the skin, they're closed. If they're outside the skin, they're open, okay? So that's where these two terms come in, open or closed, same thing as compound or simple. So any of these right here, any of these fractures could be simple if, they're with, if they stay inside the skin. If any of these, for some reason, more so stuck out of the skin, it would be compound fractures. So usually it'd be any kind of displaced fracture that would be compound. And they call that open or closed, whether it's broken out or stay inside the skin. So that's that. Any questions on fractures like this to explain these terms? One more time, incomplete just means the bone is broken, but still put together, still connected to each other. Complete would mean it's broken and, and it's in two separate pieces. So out of these pictures here, <clears throat> which one is complete? That one in the middle, yeah. This is the only one that's broken into two, two whole pieces, really. The other ones are joined with other connective tissues, so it's still so okay. So real quick on some pictures. Let's check this out, all right? That's a nasty little uh, fracture near the ankle. That's an example of a comminuted in fragments. This is an example of a compression fracture. You can see one of the, the spinal bones was crushed right there. Typical with osteoporosis happening quite a, quite a lot. People don't even know it, right? They stepped off the curb wrong. 
hit the ground hard or they, or even not without osteoporosis, they you slip and fall on your butt, you go down the steps on your butt, you know, or you're on a jet ski, you hit a hard wave, right? You ride a horse for your life. I saw a lot of, a lot of people with injuries that rode horses for their living. These kind of factors here. And you don't really know it until you see an x-ray. People just think they have back pain, you know, when really they broke their vertebra like 10 years ago and never knew it. So unless it pinches the nerve, they really won't feel a sharp pain. It just feels like an ache. You know, it'll be tender, just like an ache. Uh, there's a growth plate fracture. Can't miss that. That had to hurt. Uh, and then this right here, a spiral, like a sports twisting fracture. And there's that staple hitting the head right there. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> and um, there's your typical green stick. It's still broken here, but it's connected. So that would be like, you know, somebody hits you in the leg or something like that, or could be a football injury also. Okay. It's that last thing I want to show you on this PowerPoint would be just to show you where um, you get bone healing stronger than what it was before when you do get a fracture. Bone has a extremely, extremely good prognosis for healing, for recovery. The only time it doesn't is if you're really young or older. That's when the complications can happen because calcium, you know, infiltration is not as reliable. But yeah, you end up with what's called a bony callus. I want you to know the term. That's what's necessary. I don't know why my mouse gets stuck like that. That bony callus is going to form where the fracture once was. That means a stronger bone, a thicker bone, is going to be laid down here, which is visible on x-ray. It'll show up a brighter white color. And that's because that's called the bony callus, where it heals. But yeah, we go back. Um, when, it, when you get the break in bone initially, it's just a lot of blood loss, of course. That's where all the bruising comes from under the skin layers. Then we get uh, new fibrocartilaginous um, callus being formed with osteoblasts, chondroblasts first, then osteoblasts all over again. And then the mineralization comes. So really we're going back in time and remaking the bone. We put some cartilage down, put some bone down, and we make it stronger than before. Okay, guys, last thing uh, for reduction. Uh, not on the test, but just uh, to say that an open reduction would mean you had surgery to fix a displaced fracture in some way. Closed reduction is they manipulate your bones without having surgery and put them back in place. Yeah. You know, that's, what that's what happened to mine. Which one was it? My left one, I think. Yeah. The doctor in the ER just he felt the bones, he could feel the bone out of place. He saw the next ray. He just manipulated the bones back into place. And I was like, oh my God, I've got to do that. <laughs> so that's what kind of stuck me on my path. That was a closed reduction. Open reduction is something like this when they put pins and uh, screws in hardware to keep the bones. And they stay there basically you know, to put those bones back together. All right, so last picture here is going to be from osteoporotic bone. This is lack of bone density, is osteoporosis. The one we saw before with the crooked legs, the bowed legs, that was osteomalacia, bone softening. That's a mineralization problem, right? This here, osteoporosis, look at all the holes in the bone, the pores. This is a bone density problem. So I don't want you to get those two confused. Osteoporosis, yes, it has to do somewhat with calcium because you're obviously losing calcium if you're losing density. 
but its primary problem is bone density being lost. So fractures occur very often, whereas fractures don't occur often in osteomalacia, right? Because the density is there, but uh, the calcium is just not there in malacia. All right, guys, that does it for um, chapter seven. So we'll click, quickly jump just a little intro into chapter eight. And really, it's just to skim through those skull bones real fast. You should have had this in lab. This is a little intro in the Czech Republic, a church that shows us all the monks that gave their skulls in service. That's quite interesting. Very ornate. So they're all real. So we know the divisions by now. Um, axials, what we did last week in lab, we'll start with upper extremity axial, uh, appendicular this week in lab. But this is our frontal bone, of course. Um, the benefit of this chapter is it's things that you can learn on your own. I'll, I don't need to stand up and show you the frontal bone. I mean, I, I think it speaks for itself. Not much to teach there. Um, but if you want to go through and practice, uh, if you want to fill in the answers to these questions, I got the answers on my lab PowerPoint if, uh, just to save some time. So for in here, since there's no pictures on this test for, for this kind of stuff, I'll test you on things like what is the frame and magnum important? Why is it important? And it's going to be the answer to this question, right? What passes through that hole? The spinal cord. What bone is it on? Occipital bone. So those are the kind of questions you'll see in here. Occipital condyles makes the joint with which bone? C1 atlas. Yes. So check out the lab PowerPoint for all those little clues. There's our temporal bone with the mastoid and the zygomatic process. That's that bridge of bone across the side of your cheek there. Then we have the parietal bone, nasal, sphenoid, giving us the optic canals where the optic nerves pass through right there at the top. And the cell terska, those two landmarks belonging to the sphenoid bone. So this is really just a rehash from lab. So think of the sphenoid being relevant for vision or anything to do with the eyes. Whereas the ethmoid right above it in the brown is more important, more relevant for smell, for the nose. So there's our ethmoid. It has these little holes in it that are going to carry the nerve fibers for smell. So as long as in lecture, you can make the association between, because maybe some of you don't have it for lab. So I'm telling it here for lecture, ethmoid for smell, sphenoid for vision. Try to make that association in your notes, you will see something like that. There's our maxilla bone for the face and the upper mouth. The mandible for the jaw. Lacrimal bone right there on the inner inner eye wall socket. Inferior nasal concha bone. This is going to help filter the air when it's lined with mucous membranes. We're going to call that a turbinate bone. We'll, we'll pick up there next lecture. Uh, last thing for today is um, the cleft palate is a non-union of these two bones, maxilla and palatine which are both the two bones that make the roof of your mouth all the way down, those two bones right there. So know what causes the cleft palate. Maxilla and palatine bone, non-union. So we'll finish there. Have a great day. I'll see you Thursday.